Hello again, everybody. This next session is called In Conversation with a Unicorn, What Makes a Good Co-Founder? There are so many different factors that can influence a company's rise. Our next two speakers are payment partners in crime, and they believe that finding the right co-founder is critical and crucial to their success. And believe me, they know success. So ladies and gentlemen, in conversation with Josh Constein of TechCrunch, please join me in welcoming to the stage Rob Frowine and Catherine Petralia, the co-founders of Cabbage. Thank you. Hello. Uh, oh, and now we can hear you. Whoa. Hey, hi. So you guys are called Cabbage, but you're really all about getting businesses that lettuce, aka those business loans. And you've turned that into a $1.3 billion valuation business of your own. But why do you philosophically care about this space that admittedly is kind of unsexy? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, thanks for the opener there. Uh, um, Really, because Catherine and I are very unsexy people, so no. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it comes down, it's funny, when we started the business, we started it because it was really a data and technology focus. We were pulling data directly from APIs where the authorization was provided by the customer and yada, yada, yada. There was a real technical and data approach. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is over the last couple of years, few years, I think our, it's, it's not that our focus hasn't shifted away from data and technology. We've just so much embraced the customer and been focused on that journey and that hardship. And I think part of it for me personally was just um, post-traumatic stress syndrome flashbacks uh, to when I was a small business owner, which is what I had before we started Cabbage. I'd also like to argue the point that small businesses are sexy. Many people in here are small businesses. In the US anyway, they're responsible for half of the non-farm GDP, two thirds of all new jobs, and every dollar deployed to small businesses creates $4 in economic growth in that community where the business is. That's actually very sexy. I didn't know that before we started this business. So ignorance in many ways, I think, was our friend. So given that you're in that space where you have to kind of convince people that it's sexy, you know, how do you go about doing that? What was your superhero origin story that really made you guys care about this so much and made you the best winners? You know, I like to think of startups as having these start, uh, superhero origin stories. Like we all know Batman's parents got killed and so we wanted to clean up the streets of Gotham. And I think a lot of actually startups have a similar kind of story, maybe not quite as dramatic, but I would love to hear how that, how that influenced the start of Cabbage. We, you know, I think there's a couple of things. One is, you know, we were, we were based in Atlanta, Georgia, which is not the startup capital world, you know, startup capital of the world. Um, we're older than the average startup founder. Um, I have a female co-founder, which frankly, when, I start, when we started the company, I didn't realize, but that was something that a lot of venture capitalists sort of straight, stayed away from. That's terrible. Um, yeah, it was, but it's reality at the time. And, you know, I, I think what it was is we just, we just had this determination to get it done. And the other thing is, we turned it into a story. And I, I think the thing that we can really recommend to everybody here who has a startup or is thinking about a startup is turn what you're trying to do into a story that everybody can really relate to. And that's what we did. We created these, we literally created these characters. Bill, who was the um, small business owner, you know, who ran a great business, but needed a little bit of capital to get, to get bigger and to grow. And then you had Rich, the evil banker, who was not willing to give him any money. And we, and we literally did it in cartoon form because we realized that that was the best way to communicate with venture capitalists. So with, uh, with Cabbage starting outside of the Silicon Valley in Atlanta, you know, I think a lot of people in this room, they're, they're, we're literally just so far away from Silicon Valley right now. A lot of the people here don't have some of the benefits there. Also, there's plenty of problems in the Bay Area as well. But what was it like starting a, a company so far away from an innovation uh, center? And how did you overcome that? 
Something most people don't know about Atlanta is that 80% of all electronic payment transactions in the U.S. flow through Atlanta-based companies. So there's a lot of technology in Atlanta. As it happens, a lot of it's not new technology, but it's fintech. Um, the challenge for us wasn't hiring people. We could find great people in Atlanta. It's a great place to live. Um, a lot of wonderful, talented people are in Atlanta. The challenge is raising money. The venture community is small and it's early stage in Atlanta. So we spend a lot of time on planes flying to the West Coast and to the Northeast to get capital to, for our business. So that was probably the hardest part. And I think the hardest part today, flash forward 10 years, is you know finding really senior executives from around the country and around the world who we had to convince them relocating to Atlanta is really good. We promise you're going to like it. Do you ever have VCs trying to pressure you to move like the company to one of those big hubs? Yeah, so, so we absolutely did. We, um, we had one very well, one of the most well-known venture capital firms that asked us to move out west when we started, but we were all married with kids and, you know, there was no chance we were going to do that. And so we really focused. And the funny thing is, is there's been such a migration of, of venture capital firms that have that are now willing to actually get on a plane and go places. Steve Case, who runs Wet Revolution, partners out of DC, wrote a book called The Rise of the Rest. And it's really about getting investors to get up off their butts from their, in their cozy offices and get out into the community and learn about the companies that exist outside of, uh, outside of you know, southern, Northern California. So maybe instead of the entrepreneurs always having to do the traveling, the investors should be going out and actually doing their job of scouting for these companies instead of just looking for them in their own backyard. Well, we're fortunate. I mean, you know, we have a, you know, obviously we found um, investors who are willing to do that. And, and we hope that they now believe that that was a good investment to make. So, you, yeah, you guys recently raised $250 million uh, from SoftBank. Uh, what has it been like working with this massive giant, this, uh, you know, with, the, or sorry, with, uh, with, with Vision Fund? And what's that like? Um, it, their money is fantastically spendable. <laughs> so we've really enjoyed that aspect of it. And they're, they're great. They have a ton of great experience. There are a lot of great companies in their network. I think one thing that's exciting about being part of the SoftBank family is the focus they have on um, putting together the companies in their portfolio so that we can all work together. Um, and that symbiosis, I think, is intended to help everyone grow. Are you getting access to like, their portfolio companies and connections with them to sort of push more, com uh, I, more people towards Cabbage? I mean, access in the form of, you know, Rob Meat. Catherine, you know, in an email form, yes. I mean, they're certainly willing to make introductions for us within, the port within their portfolio companies and their network, just like any investor would be willing to do. Um, they just happen to invest in companies that, you know, are a couple of uh, magnitudes larger than the, than the average company out there. So there's been this recent trend of a lot of big foreign capital flooding into United States companies. Uh, and the, the concern is that there could be cultural influence that comes along with that. I think we've really dealt with that as Silicon Valley starts to realize maybe taking money from, uh, from Saudi Arabia comes with more strings than they realize. Uh, what do you think about that, that trend? And do you think that there's dangers for uh, like sort of a cultural invasion or that soft power that comes through investment from big foreigns? Oh, we're definitely learning Japanese. No, I'm just kidding. We're not <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> um, actually, you know, it's, I don't think there's a, there's a cultural uh, influence that happens in that situation. Look, the, the thing, and Catherine spoke to this before, the thing that we're incredibly focused on is helping small businesses, which are, have always been the, you know, sort of ugly redheaded stepchild, not if you're an ugly redheaded Can stepchild. Can you just be redheaded and not ugly? You, I don't know. I thought that's the saying. But, you know, even if, you know, for these small businesses, getting access to capital has always been incredibly hard. So we're focused on that mission. Um, and so finding partners that are able to help us in that mission is really, really important. And being able to, you know, really execute on that mission as quickly as possible is also very important. We, you know, we want to invest the funds that come in into the small businesses we, uh, we support. So being a startup founder is really about being scrappy, like doing whatever it takes sometimes to win, as long as you're hopefully staying within the moral boundaries. Uh, you have some pretty funny stories from your early days, maybe a little bit morally gray, but uh, maybe you could just tell us, like, what have you gone, what lengths have you gone to to, to keep cabbage in the public eye? 
you should talk originally about the eBay and take it going out to folks, and I'll tell the other one. So early on, we were serving eBay businesses. That was sort of the, the genesis of our story. And in order to find those customers, we went to these eBay events that were on location around the country. And we found that just buying someone a beer had a tremendous impact on their interest in talking to us and, and potentially becoming a customer. So we were all of us, there were three of us who started the company. We were all there on location talking to eBay sellers, getting them excited, finding influencers, getting them excited. And that's actually how we got started. It's how we got our first group of customers. And that was really important to make those deep connections. And many of those people are still customers and connections and evangelists for Cabbage today. Judge, think, judging by the scene on Pink Street last night, I think Web Summit must be very successful in getting deals to happen out here. Uh, plenty of beer flowing. Uh, what about you? Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the other story, which I had shared a little bit backstage, is um, one of the first big events that we attended was something called was TechCrunch Disrupt, which many of you are familiar with, but this was the very first one that was ever put on in May of 2010. Um, and what I did was, we were, we were not invited to present on stage, but we were invited into what was called Startup Alley, which was 50 companies spread across an alley with a middle aisle, main aisle going through it. Um, so I went to the venue at 6.30 in the morning before it started because I wanted to see where our table placement was. So in this aisle, the best spot was to be on the front of the aisle, right on the right-hand side. And we were far in the back. We had the furthest table on the right-hand side. So as any good startup founder would do, I just switched the signs. <laughs> and You stole um, somebody's spot? I, well, you know, the interesting... I, it wasn't stealing because I thought it was, you know, part of marketing. And yes, maybe a little questionable from, from some folks' perspective. But the karma kick on that was that um, we were trying to get as many votes as possible because one company would be invited to go up on stage. And so we actually came in second in votes. The company that came in first was the company I switched with um, on the <laughs> other side, uh, which is Betterment, which some of you may know as a robo wealth. Uh, company, so they actually got up on stage, and I, um, we did not. <laughs> That's okay. I think I think all startups sometimes have those kind of low points, which don't go quite the way they want. And the problem is that a lot of startups don't want to talk about this. There's kind of this bad culture in startup world about always crushing it. Like you're always winning, you're always succeeding. And the problem is that that's just not true. And when founders look out and they see everybody else seemingly crushing it with their photos on Instagram, it can feel like I'm the only one failing. Uh, and I think we need to get past that by getting more startup founders to be more vulnerable, accept ex executive coaching, and really level with each other about how hard it can be. So do you guys have, I'd love to hear about like, what was the lowest moment for Cabbage and for you two as founders and how did you m uh, make your way out of that? You, you wanna go or you want me to go? You go first. Um, so uh, the lowest point was August, 2013. We were a hundred people. Um, our bad debt, meaning the amount of money that folks were not paying us back exceeded our revenue. Um, we went through a layoff. We let um, 25 of our 100 employees go. Um, we uh, had to call meetings. Um, worst experience of my life. Um, we had, you know, five different executives, including Catherine and me, speak to groups of five at a time. We had this whole plan for how we were going to do it. Um, crushing, just, you know, soul-crushing moment. Um, and then from there, um, we kind of righted the ship. But, you know, I think... I think the key is, is that was a low moment, but we, but we decided we were going to take decisive action. We were going to change the way things were running and we were going to build from there. And that's exactly what we did. You, you were going to say the same thing? That's uh, the most obvious low point. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that like emotionally? Like, was it tough to just wake up and go to the office? Did you ever spend a day like, I just can't read email. I'm not going to the office. I'm going to disappear for a day. Or how do you take care of yourself mentally in those really tough times? It's not really about you at that time. I mean, 25 people's lives are being impacted by the decision that you made. So um, I think it's, you can't think about yourself at that point in time. It's a little bit selfish, I think, to get in the middle of it. I cried all day. It was awful. How do, if you have any advice for startup founders who are going through those kind of situations, what, what can they do to try to pull themselves out of it? I, I, I think the first thing is actually to step back for a moment. Don't, I think always staying humble and not getting way ahead of yourself is really important. I know there's this 
uh, feeling like there's got to be a huge amount of bravado and you know hype around your business and yes you've got to be the greatest salesperson for your business but at the same time you've got to stay humble as to where you are um, and I think that's so hypercritical. So you guys have had a lot of success with fundraising since the, those times. And I know a lot of companies out there, that's really the toughest part. I think fundraising and hiring are consistently what I hear from founders are the most challenging. Uh, do you guys have any unconventional tips you might give to the startups in the audience who are trying to figure out if they can ever land that five, 10, 100, $250 million round? You have to ask for the money. That's the hardest part. So you go to meetings and you talk to people and you tell them your story and then you leave. If you don't follow up and say, hey, I'd like the money, they're probably not gonna give it to you unless you just are one of these very rare cases where everybody's following you for money. We learned from our third co-founder, you know, ask for referrals, ask for the money, ask again for the money if you don't get the money the first time. I think you just have to be really, really, really diligent in following up. And otherwise, nobody's gonna write you, especially your first check. I think one of the funnest stories from fundraising was after we closed our Series A, our other co-founder gave us a bottle of champagne. There were seven of us in the company. It had a label on it for each of us individually that said, to be opened by Cabbage when Cabbage reaches a value of X dollars. We went for our next round, fundraising round, we got a term sheet for a price below what was on the bottle. And what we said to that investor, we said, Brian, we said, the offer's not high enough. We need to be able to open up the bottle of champagne. And he said, I'll just buy you guys a damn bottle of champagne. <laughs> we said, no, we want to do this. So we increased the price still below. We said, what didn't you understand? So then he eventually increased the price again. And we were able to close that round and open the bottle of champagne. Now, there is some danger with like optimizing for valuation. You know, the higher you come, the further you have to fall. You, did you ever deal with a moment where it was like, oh my gosh, we, we went for that high valuation. What happens if we have a down round next time? What if we can't make those milestones? Every time you raise money, you run that risk. I think you just have to keep running and keep building the business and make sure that it's bigger every day than it was the day before. Great. Well, to recap some of the awesome insights from Cabbage, you know, they think that small businesses are arguably sexy and the loans that they provide allow people to turn their passion or their hobby into a real profession. Um, and the way that you get there to becoming a business of their size is by having that determination and telling a real story. Sometimes you can even use cartoons, make up characters, whatever you have to do to make those investors or those recruits see in their head the vision you have for the future. Uh, and you don't always have to start in Silicon Valley or some special place like that. You know, pick a great place that people want to live near great schools where there's good, uh, good talent coming out. And you can do the travel yourself to find that funding, even though maybe it's the investors that should be doing more of that travel and scouting. Um, and when things get hard, be decisive. Remember, it's not about you. Try to stay humble and just do what you can to keep the company alive. Uh, ask for the money, ask for referrals. You know, sometimes you have to go against your own instincts and do what can feel awkward. But you know, sometimes all can really take is it just takes buying somebody a beer and having a real chat with them heart to heart, and suddenly your business can grow in all new ways. So I hope you guys all have as much success as Cabbage has. Thank you guys so much for talking with us, and thank you all for thank watching. You.